So, by now, it's clear that the we is becoming something of an unstoppable force. The sales aren't slowing down, the positive buzz isn't stopping, and it's looking like a mathematical improbability that it won't end up being the biggest selling console of this generation. No one predicted it, no one expected it, but somehow it happened. Nintendo is back on top of the mountain. Yes, that Nintendo. The we're sticking with cartridges Nintendo. The Virtual Boy Nintendo. The Friend Codes Nintendo. A console war that was supposed to be King Kong vs. Godzilla has so far consisted of both lumbering giants getting a beatdown from a fucking gizmo. The phenomenon of Nintendo making a shitload of money has been followed by the inevitable after-effect, Nintendo fans bragging about it. Now, fanboyism is a problem with all geek subcultures, yes, but there's no denying that in the world of video games, the behavior of Nintendo's more extreme boosters is truly something to behold, especially considering how often it comes as a reaction to corporate profits. It's one thing to get all smiley when your console and or publisher of preference releases a masterpiece. It's slightly different to act like you just helped take San Juan Hill because the guys who made your console increased their market share. To its biggest fans, Nintendo isn't a company or even a brand, it's damn near a religion. Speaking as a moderately sane, frequent Nintendo fan myself, I think I can help explain some of what's going on here. First, let me just admit something that most ultra-devoted Nintendo fanboys won't. We were, and remain, just a little bit concerned about the company's new direction, too. We thought we sounded like a strange name at first, just like you did. Know what else? Most of us aren't as nuts about Wii Sports as all the casual gamer newcomers are, just like you. We got our Wii for the same reason we got our GameCubes, okay? It was the only way we were going to get the new Mario, the new Zelda, Metroid, Kirby, Pokemon, Animal Crossing, and Smash Brothers games. Yeah, most of us are digging the new Wii stuff, too. But when Nintendo fans tell you they knew all along that this would be a worldwide phenomenon, yeah, that, that's usually bullshit, guys. And that's the thing. Most of the lifelong Nintendo diehards probably don't see Wii Fit as the coming of the new messiah, but when it hits the US and sells the inevitable millions of copies and gets talked up on the morning shows, on every other episode for an entire year, they'll be the first ones high-fiving each other with glee and telling the aghast Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 owners to suck it. Usually, if you want to see this kind of almost creepily sincere devotion, you've got to hit up an Obama rally. Where does this come from? Why are they so devoted to the fortunes and reputation of not just a console, but its brand, its makers, and its company? The answer, or at least a big part of it, is simple, but not easy. I'm going to attempt to lay it out, but I'm going to have to ask you to use your imagination for a moment, okay? Picture this. You're walking down a dark and miserable street, following a dark and miserable day at work. A sudden sense of the familiar comes over you, and as you stop to take note of your surroundings, you're struck by the realization that you're standing in front of the house you grew up in. And when I say the house you grew up in, I mean precisely that. It's painted like it was when you were a kid. Your treehouse is still standing. Dad's car is in the driveway. That asshole who moved in after you and tore down the swing set and sandbox so he could build a barbecue pit? He's not living there. Before you can get your bearings, you hear an unmistakable but impossible sound coming from the backyard. It can't be, you tell yourself, but your legs are already moving. You dash to the yard, you take one look and you drop to your knees in total astonishment as you realize that in defiance of all known laws of this world or the next, your dog is alive again. Part of you wants to know what's going on, part of you doesn't really care, you're just indescribably happy. And just then there's a sound from the bushes. You turn, you swallow hard, expecting at any moment M. Night Shyamalan is going to spring forth and tell you that you died on the way out of work and that this is heaven, but it's not the director of the village. Instead. The bushes yield a funny Japanese man. He announces himself as the proprietor of this magical place, and makes known both his ability and his intention to maintain and preserve it for however often and however long you may wish him to. In compensation, he asks only for roughly $200 and change, once every six or seven years, so that he may continue to finance the production of niche market video game consoles. Before he can continue or answer his terms, your attention is drawn to the near horizon, over it you can hear the gnashing of teeth and the stomping of cloven hooves. An army is approaching, a dark army representing everything that is corrupt and painful and dark about the world outside your newly found oasis. Without a word passing between the two of you, you come to understand the stakes. If the funny Japanese man is not here to guard this magic place where everything that was once good and right in the world remains unspoiled, it will fall to this army of evil. If he doesn't stop them, they will burn your childhood home to the ground or repurpose it into some dark abomination, and then they'll shoot the dog and prop his corpse up as a grotesque puppet show. As proof of this, your eyes are drawn to what's left of the Sega house across the street. Given that, 
Given all that, wouldn't you give the funny Japanese man the money? Hell, would it really be odd to find yourself swearing allegiance and fealty to this great man and his holy mission? Well, that writ large is basically what's at play when it comes to Nintendo's relationship with their most devoted fans. It's not just that the Nintendo brand and their studiously maintained uh, roster of characters is permanently tied to some of their happiest childhood memories, it's that the abstract idea of Nintendo at one point represented something more than just a corporation. It was an identity, a rallying point, and a comfort zone. Part of this was the godsend of timing. Nintendo entered the American game market as more or less the only game in town following the devastating video game crash of 83, and for long enough they had de facto domination of the whole field. Just like how here in Boston nobody says, I'm going to watch the baseball game, but rather, I'm going to watch the Sox, back then we didn't say, I'm playing video games, we said, I'm playing Nintendo. Often, if we weren't talking about games from Nintendo, it's just what we did. Eventually, even so-called fanboys grow up, and much like everyone else, the impetus generally comes from the world itself refusing to remain inert. Old friends slip away, people move, pets, parents, and loved ones grow old and even die. This, the acceptance of impermanence, is what strips away the comfortable civility of childhood and forges the tough outer skin of adult life. The variable in all this, however, is that the realization that the things you love aren't forever will ultimately do nothing to dampen the jolt you're going to feel when something you love actually does stick around and stay gold. Gamers who came up in the Golden Age era have had to accept a lot of impermanence. Atari is gone. Commodore is gone. In television and ColecoVision too. They've had to watch Sega abandon consoles and then look on helplessly as Sonic the Hedgehog took a mangling that Eli Roth would term excessive. They've seen games and franchises that once upon a time meant as much to them as coonskin caps and radio flyers meant to their parents' generation get treated like forgotten, disposable commodities, slipped in like Cracker Jack prizes as bonus content on new blockbusters, or reissued as bargain-priced classic collections. And yeah. It's fun and convenient to be able to get, say, the Genesis collection for like $9.99 on your PS2, but just keep in mind there's more than a few guys out there for whom the stuff on that disc might as well be called the Billy's Memories collection, and essentially represents someone taking half a lifetime of birthdays, Christmases, good report cards, and that one time he beat the last guy in Shinobi and took the picture of the completion screen to show it around to all his friends who thought it was great, squashing it onto a CD, tossing it into the discount bin with all the unsold copies of All Pro Football 2K8. This, in the end, is the answer to the one-word question of Nintendo in the modern gaming world. They're still here, and they haven't done a lot of changing. They've grown, but the characters and the mood and the Nintendo vibe have stayed constant, a living, tangible, physical link between the past and the present. Mario is still basically the same guy you remember, and even if you took some time off from gaming between then and now, he's been there, unchanged and waiting for you to get back, like Winnie the Pooh waiting for Christopher Robin in that fucking Kenny Loggins song that that I'm just not going to talk about because I won't be able to finish this recording. <clears throat> Nintendo spent a lot of money back in the day marketing to make sure that like Walt Disney and Marvel Comics before them, young consumers saw them as benevolent buddies and not just corporate overlords. So yeah, they're thrilled now that the Wii exists, period, just because it means another few years to go before the Nintendo collection is sitting in that discount bin. But that it's a hit? That suddenly Nintendo might be back in charge of the industry? That's too much like the world rewinding itself to the good old days. I don't think it's hyperbole to suggest that, to some of us, just the thought of that is the fanboy equivalent of, kids, your mom and I are getting back together. Sure, there's a cynical component to all this, since, after all, what it boils down to is that something like 50-60% to 60 of Satoru Iwata's yearly business model involves cracking open the fanbase's collective cranium, plucking out Christmas morning 1984, and then selling it back to them for 500 Wii points. But even I can't be a cynic all the time. Some of Nintendo's fanboys need to get a clue, but most of them, most of them are just like you and me. Grown-up geeks, mature and well-adjusted, but occasionally prone to revisiting the far too populous cemetery of our happy times gone by, and glad to see that at least one grave has yet to be filled.